to assess and enhance quantum computing performance. And part of that is figuring out what quantum, what quantum computing performance actually means. Because there's always aspects of the quality of a quantum computer that are being discovered or that didn't make sense until we got to today's stage of quantum computing capability. So the way that we assess quantum performance is to look at all the different things that go into building a baby quantum computer, since that's all we have at this point. Um, in part, we focus on quantum computing components, the individual qubits, the elementary gates, the measurements, the resets, the nitty gritty details of what go into a quantum computer. But at the same time, we look at the performance of integrated quantum computing processors, like the test beds that are available from IBM Q or Rigetti or IonQ or Honeywell now, the Department of Energy QScout and AQT test beds that are being stood up at Sandia and at LBNL, and all of the other fully integrated multi qubit processors that are popping up here and there, and that claim to be and can be treated as quantum computers, just really, really small ones. One of the most impressive quantum computers is Google Sycamore that was used to demonstrate quantum supremacy last year. But if you think about it, that's expensive, it's challenging, it's really impressive, it's still only 53 qubits. A 53-bit classical computer wouldn't be good for very much. So these are still babies. But the more we can learn about how they perform, how they fail, and what they're capable of, the better we can do at improving the next generation and also coming up with algorithms and applications that might run on today's hardware or the next generation. It's not as useful to come up with an algorithm that requires three orders of magnitude better performance than you have available right now. So these two aspects of our research split into predictive characterization and holistic benchmarking. Holistic benchmarking is what something like LINPAC does in the classical computing world. It asks, how well does this whole system work together? And if your system does really well or really poorly at LINPAC, that doesn't usually give you very much information about what might be going wrong. That's the role of predictive characterization, which focuses on individual components and isolating performance bottlenecks, or in the case of quantum computing, error modes, because the, by far the most important thing about the performance of a quantum computer is not how fast it runs, but how long can it go on average before encountering or creating an error? And what are the kinds of errors? So we wanna know in predictive characterization, what is this component doing exactly? And what will happen if I use it in specific ways? We wanna be able to predict not just the programs, the circuits that we ran, but other circuits in the future. And that requires building an error model. So most of the protocols that have been developed for characterizing quantum computers fall more or less into one of these two buckets, either predictive characterization that produces quantitative models for device behavior or holistic benchmarking that's designed to give you an overall figure of merit describing how good or how capable this device is. Um, the exemplars, at least so far, for these categories of protocol are gate set tomography, which is something that was sort of invented a couple of places and has really been developed by Sandia's QPL over the last several years, which is the prototypical predictive characterization protocol. It builds a model for a set of gates that is designed to really detailed describe what those gates are doing. Um, the exemplar for, for holistic benchmarking is probably randomized benchmarking, which sort of twirls all of the errors up into a single figure of merit. But actually these lines are a bit blurred because really randomized benchmarking originated as more of a predictive characterization protocol that would focus on individual qubits. So RB looked at from today's perspective really is a holistic benchmarking protocol. Whatever you run it on, whether it's one qubit or a bunch of qubits, it's giving you a single overall figure of merit. But in practice, it is very often used in the spot where you would use a predictive characterization protocol, 
to measure error rates. So when people build a new qubit or a refinement of an old qubit or a new two qubit gate, they very frequently use randomized benchmarking to measure the error rates and then make implicit assertions about how good this qubit is by how well it would perform at, let's say, error correction, where there's a threshold for error correction to actually improve the operation of a device, you need the error rate to be below a certain number. And ad hoc, numbers from randomized benchmarking are often used to determine whether we're above or below or how close we are to that threshold. So this creates a sort of an interesting um, dual paradigm where something that really is a better at being a holistic benchmark is being used for predictive characterization in an ad hoc way to generate a simple error model, which is to say an error rate. Now, we know that the thing that randomized benchmarking really measures is something called an average gate set fidelity, but that often gets sort of munged over into a predictive model. And gate set tomography gives a much more detailed predictive model involving process matrices. So predictive model-based quantum characterization verification and validation follows this simple template. You start by taking some experimental data, and then you use that experimental data to infer or fit the parameters of a model for your logic operations. And logic operations include gates, measurements, uh, readouts, state initializations, all the various things that you can do logically on a quantum computer. So the experimental data is usually a bunch of quantum circuits of some sort or another. Here I've given some examples for a single qubit processor. Here is what's called the spam circuit because all you do is state preparation and measurement. Here's a circuit that's got state prep, measure, a single gate, and then a measurement. And then you can do more and more complicated sequences of gates in between. And from this experimental data, you infer something that will model each of these individual logic operations that could go into a quantum circuit. So I've got several different gates here. Here's an X gate on the first qubit, and that appears at several different points in this circuit. Here's a C naught on the second and third qubits that appears at several different points. And the idea of QCDV is to infer these models from a limited amount of experimental data and then, no matter what circuit you build, you can plug in the models for the elementary logic operations that you've discovered previously and predict how that circuit will work. In practice, the model isn't just created out of whole cloth every time you do a new QCDB experiment. It's some fixed dynamical model that has parameters in it. And the way that we do this inference from the experimental data to the model is by varying those parameters and finding the best fit to the data. So you wiggle whatever parameters you have available in your model and you keep asking, does it fit the experimental data? A classic and common example of this is maximum likelihood estimation. That's one way to vary the parameters and find the parameter values that give you a specific concrete model that fits that data well. I mean, this is, this is really at the core of science, right? So a toy example that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics of such a model and some data would be data that's plotted on a scatter plot. And we've all done or seen things like this all the way back to undergraduate or before, where we try to model this by a linear line, y equals ax plus b. And x and y are the coordinates along which my data is plotted I'm trying to find the A and the B that fit this data the best. And so here's a pretty good fit where I've got an estimated A, that's A hat, and an estimated B, that's B hat. So here's my fit to this data, and I've come up with a model that attempts to predict or retrodict the data that I took. In the case of quantum computers, this gets a little bit more complicated, but what I want to emphasize is the principle is the same. The experimental data now is the results from running a long list of quantum circuits. This is just the beginning of an actual data set. There's about 2,500 rows in this particular data set. And from that data, we can infer a model for the logic operations. In gate set tomography, that model is a process matrix describing each gate. 
So these are examples of process matrices that describe uh, in this particular experiment that we did, an idle gate, a pi over two X rotation, and a pi over two Y rotation all on a single qubit. And if you're familiar with process matrices, you can stare at these and say, ah, yes, I know that some of these elements should be one and some of them should be zero. And the deviations between the process matrix that we measured, that we fit to the data, and the ideal one is down in the sub 10 to the minus three level. And that means these are pretty good gates. Okay. So Sorry, Robin, uh, there's a question yeah. in the chat box. I don't know if you can see them. I can also. Uh, uh, could you just read it? That's probably easier than me clicking over. Sure. Uh, so Paul Gleishoff is asking, does the metric used for the fit of the data makes much of a difference in constructing the model? Um, that is a good question. It depends. There's not really been a whole lot of research on that. So um, if I can flip back a bit, what that really has to do with is this box in the middle, very parameters to find best fit to data. Um, there's been limited exploration with different definitions of best fit. And really that's a statistics question. Um, each definition of what a best fit to data is gives you a different estimator. And there's a lot of wrangling in the stats community about which estimators perform better under certain conditions. Um, I don't have a simple statement about that, except to say that these days with modern QCVB protocols, it has not appeared to make much of a difference whether you use an L2, an L1, a log likelihood, or some other penalty function to measure the quality of the fit. That may not be entirely true. It really hasn't been investigated enough. So what I'm really answering is a very long and convoluted maybe. Good question. Doesn't seem to be super important, but every now and then things that we didn't think are important do turn out to be important. I will comment that where it does seem to make a bigger difference how you define a good fit is in the presence of outliers, of bad data. And that gets us into robust statistics, which is something that is going to be relevant to what I'm going to talk about here. Any other questions so far? Uh, no, please go on. Okay. So as I just hinted at, one of the problems that we deal with is that data doesn't always behave. And what I mean by that is, we can run simulations where we simulate an experiment given a particular error model. We simulate the data and then we run our analysis procedures, our, our fitting procedures on that data and yay, we recover the original error model that we were looking at. So that's good. It means that our protocols work um, in principle and then we go out and we use them in the real world and it turns out that the real experimental world is sometimes more complicated than theorists dream of. So here's a very simple example. This is actually the same plot that I showed before, but I've blown it up to focus on something that some of you probably have already noticed, which is this red line here is really not consistent with the error bars on the points. This one in particular is about a four or five sigma deviation where a sigma is represented by the error bars from the fit. Now this routinely happens in experiments, but if you point this out to a theorist or a statistician, they ought to admit that something is wrong. These points are over dispersed. They are not consistent with a linear relationship. There's something else going on where whatever it is that I'm trying to estimate is not described by a linear relationship between X and Y, it kind of goes up here and down here and up here. The point is, this is not really linear data. Now, frequently we just ignore that. We fit a line to it and we say, eh, it's the best fit line. But that means that we miss effects that we weren't expecting. Sometimes those effects are important and they, we need to allow for the fact that the data is noisier than we expected if we're trying to predict things. 
So let me give the, analog the analogous effect for date set tomography. I told you before that a GST data set usually has thousands of different circuits that are run. I've arranged all of these circuits in a particular grid over on the right. And I don't want to dwell on exactly how I've arranged them. Simply know that each box here represents a single circuit. And the color of the box comes from comparing the prediction of the GST fit, where we wiggled the parameters in all those process matrices to fit the data as well as possible to the actual observed data. And those deviations, so we expect that there will be small deviations. Why? Because experiments are random. We're basically throwing a weighted die many, many times. And you never expect the empirical frequency, the observed number of counts, to follow the predicted probability exactly. If you flip a fair coin a thousand times, you're not going to get 500 heads every single time. You get finite sample fluctuations. So this gray scatter here is consistent with finite sample fluctuations. This is what data is supposed to look like. And the histogram that I've plotted over on the left confirms that. The thin black line is the theoretical prediction for what this fluctuate, what these finite sample fluctuations should look like. There should be just a few circuits for which there's a fairly big log likelihood ratio, which is the statistic we use to quantify how different an experiment is from the prediction. There should be just a few experiments, circuits, that have large values and a lot that have smaller ones. And the color scale on this plot does correspond to the color scale, color scale over here. So again, this is what GST data is supposed to look like. If I go back a slide, this is not what line data is supposed to look like. We should not be seeing these outliers here. If this, re this data really did fit this line, these would all be close so that most of their error bars overlapped the line. And this slide shows the gate set tomography analog of that. Very well-behaved data. I know this is well-behaved because I simulated it. Let me show you what real experimental data looks like. So you might have guessed that red is not good. What's happened here is if you look at my theoretical histogram, it's this thin black line over here, which is almost invisible. And I've got a huge number of circuits whose deviation from the prediction, and by the way, the prediction here is the best fit to this data is really big and bad. They've got interesting patterns, and we've made a little cottage industry at the QPL out of sort of, you know, reading the chicken entrails of these plots and saying, aha, I know what's wrong. In this particular case, this qubit had non-Markovian dephasing. It had slow fluctuations in its qubit splitting so that there was no way to describe the Gaussian decay of coherence using a Markovian error model, and process matrices are a Markovian error model. And so GST did its best to fit the data, but it was trying to fit a Gaussian decay in the experiment with a theoretical exponential decay. And that doesn't work very well. You get big deviations. So in practice, what often happens is that, is that there's non-Markovianity in the system. We can't fit that with our Markovian model, and we get these large deviations. So the question is, what should we do at this point? Here are some options. One, we could give up, stop trying to build quantum computers and just go have a beer. Two, we could blithely ignore the discrepancy, pretend that it never happened, and just carry on claiming that our qubits are as good as we fit them to be without talking about the fact that the fit didn't actually fit the data. We could report the best fit gate set, but we could put a footnote that says, we also observed some model violation. We could go further and we could report the GST gate set together with a quantitative measure like a p-value that quantifies the significance of that model violation. This is what we usually do. Um, the p-value is often something like 10 to the minus 391. P-values quantify essentially 
how plausible is it that you could have gotten this result if your model was correct? If your p-value is about 10 to the minus six, you can discover the Higgs boson with that. That's a six sigma effect. If your p-value is 10 to the minus 391, you are really certain that your model didn't fit the data. But using standard techniques, that's kind of all you can say is we're really certain that this Markovian model didn't fit the data. So what I want to do in the rest of this talk is to come up with a new way to describe the results that allows the experimentalist and the theorist working with them to analyze the data to honestly describe what's actually going on in the system, even when their model is too simple to actually capture the physics of the experiment or explain the data. So let me use randomized benchmarking as a, a very simple sandbox for doing this. Um, RB is, as I said before, a useful holistic benchmark for one to two qubit systems, and it often gets repurposed as a predictive characterization protocol for a simple one parameter model. And this is called the error rates model. And it just says that at every stage in your quantum circuit, you're either in the correct state or in some incorrect state. And you have transition probabilities, P fail, for going from correct to incorrect. And otherwise, you stay correct at every stage in your circuit. This is a very simple model of failures that doesn't, you know, doesn't include any context for uh, the structure of the errors that could be happening. And so you've probably seen at some point randomized benchmarking plots that look something like the uh, figure I've done on the right here, where as you go to longer and longer sequences of gates, the success probability, the probability of staying in the correct state declines exponentially as it must for a simple model like this. So this green curve is going down exponentially and the blue dots are individual circuits that were run. So here's a simulation of RB on a single qubit. This is simulated data, but we simulated it with dephasing noise, only Z errors, no X or Y errors. Now, this is a model that has structure to it, just a little bit of structure, but structure. The probability of an error depends on whether you happen to be in a Z eigenstate at any given stage, in which case you can't have an error because Z errors commute, or if you're in X or a Y eigenstate, in which case you can have an error. And so indeed, we got a nice exponential decay represented by the red line to data indicated by the blue dots. And we put error bars in the blue dots, and I hope that you can tell that those error bars are not consistent with the fit, or rather, the fit is not consistent with the data. We have some five or six sigma excursions like this one right here. This data point is clearly not described by the simple model of exponential decay. So what should we do? We have two problems that have to be solved here. The first is that this simple error model's predictions aren't trustworthy. They're not even consistent with the data that we fit the model to. The second complementary problem is there's obviously something going on that we haven't successfully measured. We'd like to at least quantify how much mysterious crap is happening, even if we don't actually know what it is. So first of all, the first problem is if I look at this model, I shouldn't believe it because it's predicting things that are simply inconsistent with the data. And the second is I haven't any way to quantify the unmodeled crap. I want to solve both of these problems. We do this with something called a wildcard error model. And a wild, so a wildcard error model has at its core what we call a wildcard model. Wildcard model is very simple. Just as a probabilistic error model, which is all the error models I've been talking about so far, gate sets or the simple one parameter error model of error rates, a probabilistic error model effectively assigns a probability distribution over outcomes to every circuit. You give me a circuit, I'll tell you what its outcomes should be, what the probability of the various possible outcomes should be by using my error model. A wildcard model assigns additionally to each circuit a certain amount of wildcard error, W. And what this does is it weakens the prediction. So if this blue dot is the prediction that a probabilistic error model makes for a given circuit, then if I add 
a certain amount of wildcard error to that, what I can now do is take the entire ball around that prediction, every probability distribution within this ball of radius W and say, any and all of those are what I predict. I predict that this circuit, when you run it, will give probabilities from somewhere in that ball, not this specific point, but this larger ball around it. And I'm completely agnostic about which point. I give up. I'm not going to tell you that. So this is weakening the prediction. And if I'm comparing this prediction to data, and my data is down here and is clearly inconsistent with the original prediction, then there's some amount of wildcard W that I can add that will make this prediction into a larger and larger ball until it is consistent with the data. So I hope you can see what I'm going to do here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take an error model that makes predictions that are inconsistent with observed data, and I'm going to dole out a little bit of wildcard error at a time, thus weakening the predictions of the model until I've just managed to make the predictions not inconsistent with the data. Um, as a technical note, this, the units of W are total variation distance, which is a metric between metric of distance between probability distributions. There's a really compelling reason for using that particular metric that I'm not going to try to get into right now. Did I see a question pop up? Yes. Um, Paul is asking again if um, W is uniform across the whole data or is it, is, if it's point specific. Ah, that is an excellent question. It, so what I've said on this slide does not imply that it is the same for all circuits. And in fact, that's exactly what I'm going to deal with in the next couple of slides. We use wildcard models. So all a wildcard model has to do is assign W somehow to various circuits. Different circuits can have different W. The wildcard models that we find useful are called per gate wildcard models. And this is motivated by the fact that probabilistic models that we use in quantum computing, whether they're process matrices or error rates models, they model error on a gate by gate basis. Each gate has some error associated with it because the assumption is that gate induces some error and it adds up. The more gates you do, the more error you get. We assign wildcard the same way. Our wildcard models are parameterized by the amount of wildcard WG that each operation G gets. So here in this circuit, state initialization would get a certain amount of W, maybe 0.2%. And each Hadamard gate would get a certain amount of W, maybe 0.17%. And each CNOT gate would get a certain amount of W, maybe 2.3% as listed down here. These are totally arbitrary numbers, et cetera. So all I have to do is determine how much wildcard I'm going to assign to each gate. And then for a circuit, the amount of wildcard that that circuit gets is just summed over its gates. Very simple model of how much fudge factor a circuit should get. So bigger circuits get more wildcard necessarily because whatever's happening, even if we can't model it, is probably happening on a per gate basis. So I hope that answered the question. Feel free to you know, ask for clarification. I'm going to keep on going. Let me go back to the RB example. In this simple RB example, there's basically just two operations. There's a spam operation, state preparation and measurement. And there's an operation that is do a random Clifford gate. Randomized benchmarking doesn't dif uh, differentiate between different gates. So I can add wildcard error to this model using a two parameter wildcard model that's got two uh, wildcard rates, W spam and W gate. And each circuit gets one unit of W spam because the state gets prepared and the measurement gets performed exactly once. And then longer circuits get more wildcard proportional to W gate because they got more gates in them. So here's what it looks like before I do any wildcard. And if I add some wildcard, well, I've actually chosen two different Wild card models with different values of W spam and W gate, and each one of them is just barely enough to make this model consistent with the data. So these two trumpets here, one is red, one is green, are growing. They are 
regions that grow linearly around the core prediction. And the red one has a small amount of W gate, but more W spam. The green one has no spam wildcard, but more per gate. These are two different options. Each one of them cannot be shrunk anymore. So they are inequivalent. Neither is better than the other, but they're both feasible, as we say, wildcard models that reconcile this data and this model. So a feasible model is just a wildcard model that adds enough wildcard error to reconcile all the circuits data with their predictions. A minimal model is one where no strictly smaller wildcard budget would work. So I've plotted on a uh, XY plot here, all of the possible wildcard models for this data. And on this axis is the gate wildcard. On this axis is the spam wildcard. Everything up here in the blue region is feasible. But we don't want to add any more wildcard than we have to, because the whole point of wildcard is you're admitting that you're giving up. It's like a plea for help or something. So you want to assign the minimum that you have to, because you don't want to weaken your predictions any more than the data demand that you do. So we want a minimal model, and those are the ones along the lower boundary here. This blue region is always convex. In this particular case, it happens to be a nice piecewise linear function. And the red and green models that I showed on the previous slide and that are shown up here in this inset are indicated by these two points. Either one is a plausible choice. They're both feasible and minimal. So let me wind up in the last 10 minutes or so by going beyond this model and showing you other things that you can do with wildcard. Maybe I'll pause for just a minute. Are there any other questions before I go on into applications? So I do not see any more questions right now, at least. Yep. So people are welcome to ask them later or you know, at the end of the talk. Let's forget about RB completely. That was just a sort of spherical cow example that was useful for illustrating how this works. Here is something else that you could do with wildcard. You could use wildcard error to measure all the errors in your qubit or your quantum computer. The way you do this is you start with a model that has no errors whatsoever. It's a terrible model. It never fits the data, but you can write it down. We call it the target model. It's perfect gates. And then we just ask, well, this model has no parameters. It's just a perfect model. It predicts that every circuit should run perfectly. How much wildcard do I need to reconcile that model with the data? So here's an example of doing this. We actually simulated gate set tomography data, but we didn't do the GST analysis. We just simulated that data and then asked how much wildcard we had to add to the target model to capture it correctly. And so we've plotted here all of the circuits and some of them give are supposed to give probability one, some are supposed to give probability zero and some are supposed to give probability one half. And on a log scale, we've plotted the depth of all of those circuits. And here is a particular wildcard budget shown as a trumpet that now is much more trumpety just because I'm plotting this on a log scale. So the bounds are increasing exponentially. But it worked. We were able to capture the total error. And on the right, I've shown the result of about a 1,000 simulations with different randomly chosen gate sets where we did this. And then, just for grins, we asked whether the total amount of wildcard budget that we had to assign was related to the diamond norm error of the gates. And the answer is, yes, it is. We don't quite capture all the diamond norm error, but we correlate with it quite well. And the reason we don't capture all of it is that sometimes a given error will not perfectly align with the experiments that we're doing here. So, you could imagine doing experiments that are terribly insensitive to a particular error. You wouldn't really detect that error. We're not doing a sophisticated GST analysis, which is why if you take wildcard as being a, an estimate of the Gates diamond norm, you'll underestimate it a little bit. But it still works pretty well, given that this is a boneheadedly simple analysis. Let me come back to the sort of original raison d'etre of wildcard, which is 
We're a group that does a lot of gate set tomography on experimental data, and we're keenly embarrassed by the fact that we are constantly seeing results that look like this middle panel here, where we plot the deviations between the best GST prediction and the actual experimental data. And there's a sea of red here with circuits that we're just totally failing to predict. We think that our GST model is still pretty good, but it's missing something. So we used Wildcard in this simulated experiment to try and capture how much we were missing. And because it's a simulation, we had total control over everything. And so we know exactly what we were missing. In the simulation, we added some leakage. So we started with a good Markovian error model, some dephasing, some over-rotation, all the sort of stuff that theorists think about in terms of process matrices. And then we added 10 to the minus 4 leakage on every gate. Now, that's not very much leakage. But if you squint at my middle panel here, the horizontal axis is showing the length of these circuits. So we did circuits with 1,000 consecutive gates. And if you have 10 to the minus 4 leakage per gate, and you do 1,000 gates in a row, then you're going to end up with something like 10% leakage. And that's a pretty big signal. And that's why this leakiest gate here is glowing red, because we just couldn't model the leakage using GST's Markovian process matrix error model. However, when we did the wildcard analysis on top of that, it took this horrible inconsistent between um, model and data catastrophe and poof, got rid of the inconsistency. It did that by adding about 9 times 10 to the minus 5 wildcard error to the gate that had the leakage on it. So that worked exactly the way we wanted it to. It captured, it explained the leakage error. It didn't tell us that it was a leakage error. It just said there's something weird going on. And it told us what the rate of the something weird was pretty accurately. And it gave us a predictive model with weakened predictions that is now consistent with the data. And therefore, as long as you weaken your model appropriately, you can trust that model and use it to predict actual algorithms or error correction or whatever you want to do with this qubit. And then we went back and we reanalyzed experimental GST data from 2017 from a nature communications paper that introduced long sequence GST. And in that paper, we did several experiments. One was a sort of preliminary experiment where the qubit had not been tuned. And one was a hero experiment at the end. In the preliminary untuned experiment, we saw the actual experimental data that you see in the middle panel here. It's not as bad as the simulated leakage data, but you can see a smattering of dark gray and red points here. These are circuits that we were unable to fit using GST. And what we wanted to know was how big were these non-Markovian errors? And by adding a wildcard budget to this analysis, we showed that we only needed about 0.01% wildcard on one gate and half a percent on another gate to reconcile the fit with the data. And those numbers are smaller than the Markovian error rates that we measured using GST, which allowed us to say, OK, there's some stuff going on that we don't understand. But it is dominated by the stuff that we do understand, which validates this assertion I made earlier that, yeah, the GST fit is still useful even if it's not exactly right, because the deviations from it are now demonstrably small. And we showed that using wildcard. One of the things we're looking forward to doing, and that if you're interested in this, you might want to work on, is using wildcard error to create new quantum characterization, verification, and validation protocols. It's kind of a machine for doing this. It goes like this. I'm giving away my group secrets here. First, pick some error that you want to quantify. Now, define an error model that doesn't model error x, that's explicitly incapable of modeling that effect, but create an experiment that is sensitive to error x. Take some data. Perform your experiment. If you had error x, it should be present in your data. 
Now fit your crippled model to that data. It won't fit very well. It won't be able to because your model explicitly doesn't fit error X. Assign a wildcard model, a, a minimal feasible wildcard model to that. The amount of wildcard that you have to assign will probably be a decent metric of how much of error X is there since you started with a model that can't model X, thus forcing the wildcard model to capture it. We've been using this recently for measuring crosstalk because it's really easy to define an error model that is crosstalk free and much, much harder to define an error model that can capture all different forms of crosstalk. It's much easier to just go with a crosstalk free model and add this sort of trash bucket, which is wildcard, to capture everything that wasn't uh, captured by the error model. So here are some open questions that I'll leave you with. Um, one of the questions that I have is, despite spending a lot of time talking with statisticians, I still can't figure out whether what we're doing here is a known thing in statistics. Usually the statisticians just get horrified and run away because whatever I'm doing is sort of grungy and horrible. Um, but I feel like this ought to exist. Um, an interesting technical question is, Note, if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that wildcard is very, very sensitive to outliers because its entire purpose is to explain all the data, including the outliers. If you have true outliers that are just, you know, somebody stepped on the apparatus while that data point was being taken, you'd like to throw those out too. So how do you balance that? Um, and in a similar way, does it matter whether there's just a few circuits that are supporting your wildcard error? And if you took those away, your wildcard would become less versus having a lot of circuits supporting it. And something I skipped over entirely is how do you choose between minimal wildcard models? We clearly don't want a wildcard model that's not minimal, but is the red one or the green one better? Does it even make any sense? How should you pick between them? Um, so that's what I wanted to tell you about today. Thanks for listening and uh, please bring on the questions. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, it was a very um, clear and enjoyable talk. Um, Thank you uh, can I can I ask a question here? Um, where, where do um, the error bars come from on this plot? Is this uh, multiple simulations of the same circuit, or what is it? So, I assume that you mean. Um, on the error bars on this plot and this plot. Is that accurate? That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So each data point here is the observed success probability of a single circuit. We ran that circuit n times where n was about a thousand. And every time the circuit concluded with a measurement in the Z basis that either gave zero or one, it's supposed to give zero. If we see a one, that's a failure. Statistically, this is like flipping a coin with an unknown probability n times. And you can estimate the probability of the coin from the empirical data. If you get 100 heads and 900 tails, or 100 ones and 900 zeros, you can estimate that the failure probability is about 10%. But of course, there's, you know, you, you're not saying it's exactly 10%. There's a plus or minus on that, right? That plus or minus is derivable from statistics, from a binomial distribution. It's approximately one over root n. Those are the error bars that we're plotting here. So, so if you ran a larger n, you would have smaller error bars, is that correct? That's right. OK, and this is all in simulation, or is this experiment? Uh, what is shown on this slide are simulations. OK, thank you. Actually, I have another one. So um, if, if I look at the upper plot here, um, and there is a, a trumpet, um, like for example, a red trumpet, um, would it be correct to think of that as an uncertainty added to the parameters of the GST model as opposed to a different GST model be chosen? So that's a really good question. Um, another thing that I totally didn't address in this kind of short high level talk is, let, let me pervert your question into a more provocative one. Isn't what you're doing here just putting error bars on the parameters that you're estimating? 
Uh, thank you. And the answer is no, because what error bars mean is how uncertain are you about those parameters? And what typically happens in these cases is we are in fact extremely certain that the values of the parameters that we chose are the best values of those parameters. Footnote, the model that we chose is a terrible model. Those are the wrong parameters. We are, for example, fitting a line when we should be fitting a parabola. That doesn't directly apply to any of this. It's just an analogy. So in a nutshell, I mean, this is a good thing to have like an hour long conversation about preferably over a beer, but, but I ask you to provisionally take my word that I've thought about this and that the answer is no, these are different concepts. For a long time, we called these out of model error bars, but at the end of the day, they really aren't error bars. They are closer to the statistics concept of prediction intervals. They don't represent uncertainty about the model or the model parameters. Rather, they represent how much of the data the model is just hopelessly screwed at predicting. OK, thank you. I think you answered my question. Great. I have two more questions in the chat box, actually. Um, so the first one is, what um, can voice called models tell us about um, causality of the errors? <sighs> OK. The, the easy answer is absolutely nothing. Let me think about it for a second and see if there's you know, any modifications that I want to make to that, um, the causality of the errors. Let me, let me refine the question a little bit to make it easier Great. so you're not kind of wandering around trying to figure out what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Um, if, the, if, the sim, if, if the data is generated by simulation and you are deliberately simulating errors, you know the cause of the error. Can you take the simulated results and trace back to the cause? Um, okay. Invert okay. the problem, in short. So since, since you brought up causality, um, let me take a very brief detour into philosophy here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges with causality, one of which is illustrated um, by the following example that somebody told me a long time ago. Um, you know, forgive me, this will be a little risque, brace yourself. A simple question is, why do humans have sex? One perfectly good answer is because evolution. If we didn't, we would be extinct. Therefore, we have sex. Another perfectly good answer is because it's fun. These are totally orthogonal answers. And what I'm, I'm asking about the cause of something, but that actually is an ambiguous question. So what, when you talk about the, the cause of an error, I mean, we can say that the cause of the error in the simulation is simply that I chose to dial it in. Um, or we could say, well, but in the simulation, the cause of it is what I'm imagining the physics to be, which is a wiggle of a magnetic field. But there's no parameter in my simulation for a wiggle of magnetic field. There's just a number that I put in there that causes deviations. So my question back to you is, could you clarify you know, really precisely which, which of these various notions of cause you mean? So for purposes of this question, because the data examples you used were simulated, I am assuming that I mean the second case where you're looking for the error, not the physics. So, okay, I think, could, could I, is your question equivalent to, does Wildcard tell me anything about the mechanism yeah. of the error? Yeah, that, okay. that is a good way of reframing it. The answer is basically no. Um, it explicitly kind of doesn't do that. And the reason is that a probabilistic error model has some physics in it. Like those process matrices, they're not physics themselves, but they have a lot of physics in them. They're motivated by physics. I can look at certain terms in the process matrix and I can say, ah, that's an over-rotation term. 
in my system, that's caused by laser power. So probabilistic models connect data to causes. You know, taking a little bit wishy-washy like. The problem is that often I have effects in my data that I can't, I'm not smart enough to figure out what caused them. I'm not creative enough yet to figure out what caused them, or I just don't have enough of a signature in my data to deduce what caused them. Um, Wildcard is meant to be a safety valve for those cases. If you, if you think you can figure out the mechanism, then you should absolutely put it into your probabilistic model and verify that that is the mechanism because then either the error correction people can work around it or the experimentalists can fix it. Wildcard is a last gasp, last ditch panic button that says, I have no idea what's causing this. I give up. I just want to put a number on it. I want to put a bucket around it and say it's not too big. So it's kind of philosophically antithetical to figuring out the mechanism. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um... I'm actually going to stop uh, uh, the recording because we're at the um, end of the session, but we can keep um, going after this, actually. Um, sure. I'm happy to yeah. answer any other 